Good evening, good evening, good evening. How are you? This is Kavon Terman, and you are tuning in to Food for Thought. We're going to go ahead and set the parameters so that some of you folks, we can make this public. But today we're having a great conversation with a good brother that's from the area of Wilmington, Delaware, for those who are outside of the, the walls of uh, Delaware. So if you're tuning in, just by all means, you can ask whatever question you want to ask. We're going to go ahead and jump in there. We got a lot going on. Um, and we're excited today because this brother is getting ready to give us his platform, getting ready to ask answer a few questions. But the beauty is, of this is that we're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. So without further ado, I'm going to bring my good brother, Justin Wright. What's up, my man? Uh, good evening. Good How evening, are you? sir? How are you? I can't complain. I good, can't complain. Good, good. Excited to be here. It's good. It's good. It's good for you to be here, man. I'm. I'm really. I'm really excited to have this conversation. I want to jump right in there, if you don't mind. Tell us. Tell the folks who don't know you a little no bit problem. about yourself. Okay, so uh, I'm born and raised in the uh, city of Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, in Wilmington, growing up, uh, Wilmington was a place of promise, opportunity, and hope for me. Uh, parents uh, instill values such as hard work, giving back to the community, and being a good neighbor. Uh, opportunity of being a uh, second generation business owner now. Uh, grew up again as a state in Wilmington. I have two older brothers. Uh, my father is deceased. Uh, we have a family business, uh, House of Right Mortuary. Uh, also, I served on Wilmington City Council as an at-large member of council, so I represented the entire city uh, for eight years uh, as an at-large member of Wilmington City Council. And so that's just a brief uh, synopsis of who I am. I have a wife, Trista. We have two sons, uh, nine and three, Justin uh, the second, and Alex. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, that was, you just basically answered all my questions. Um, I want to I wanted to jump in there, though, since you mentioned it. Let's talk briefly about entrepreneurship before we get into politics, right? So one could argue that you've been groomed and pretty well in terms of business from a young age and your family is is, is built something really, really great. Um, how do you think this experience will aid you in further developing the city of Wilmington? Uh, great, great question. Uh, one of the things uh, in business, uh, in business, we've had the opportunity, we've had some uh, high moments and there are some low moments in business. And we've been able to navigate through a number of them. And as we know right now, COVID-19 has been so prevalent, which has really impacted our industry. And we've had an opportunity to uh, grow our business as well as uh, our footprint and ensuring that we're continuing to give back to the community. And being right nestled in the community and being in business, it has shown us the importance of being a good neighbor and giving back to those that are in need. And so from a business standpoint, we have the fiscal responsibility to know that uh, there are some nice to haves and there are have to haves. But in government, you can't focus on the nice to haves. You have to have a uh, focus on the have to haves. And so we've been doing that and making sure we'll be prudent with our dollars because, again, it's not our money. It's the people's money. So we also on um, the integrity within business, uh, making sure that the public trust is at the forefront and not focusing on any personal or special interests. So we've had the opportunity to ensure that, uh, of course, in the type of business that we're in, uh, without the community, we would have no business. So I understand the importance of integrity, the importance of making sure that you're running a sound business, and also the importance of, again, being a good community neighbor. So with all those uh, coupled into one and also being a product of this neighborhood, it gives me the ability to not only know uh, city government from my previous experience, but even know how to work with others. And that's very important because you've got to know how to create relationships, how to cultivate them, and to uh, forge forward to get everything um, that you would want accomplished, accomplished. Awesome, awesome. All right, so let's take a step back because you said a lot of things. You talked about uh, being a product of this area, right? Which is important. You just talk about, you talked about relationships. But let's take a step all the way back. And I'm curious, do you remember the moment it hit you where you said to yourself, politics is my lane? <laughs> Talk to us about it. So, so, so <laughs> I was standing in the parking lot, right, at the funeral home. And I was having a conversation with my older brother. And, uh, okay, let me go another step back. Let me say that um, before I was old enough to run, individuals had come to me and said, hey, uh, I think you should run for office. And I'm like, nah, that's not me. You know, I knew at a young age I wanted to follow in my father's footsteps, so I never considered public life. 
So then being here, again, nestled in the community, uh, a lot of issues come to you, believe it or not. People see as a community leader, they call you for any number of things, <laughs> you know, personal, business, civic, whatever it is, um, even religious. They, they just want guidance and assistance. And so I was standing in the parking lot having a conversation with my brother. And again, a number of people had already said to me, hey, you know, I think you'll be a good fit. And I'm just seeing my community and what I remember Wilmington to be. Uh, prior to where we were in that state. And I'm okay. like, man, you're out of part of the solution, a part of the problem. And it was right then and there. And I started to, again, think about people asking me and nudging me to run before I was even old enough. And I didn't even know that there was an age requirement because I never sought public office. Um, but I was presented at the age of like 21, 22. People coming to me, oh, man, you know, I think you'd be a good fit. But you had to be 25 to even be sworn in. So, again, I didn't know that then. But Hey, here we are. That, that's just the so the, the, when, the when you say that you're referring specifically to the office of mayor, or you're well, saying city council. I'm saying city council, okay, because that's where I got my start in public life. Okay, so for those who don't know you, talk briefly about that. And and ageism is real, so I want to talk about that as well. How old were you when you took? office and just talk about that process and if you've got any backlash because i want to talk about ageism uh because it's real oh man so look <laughs> running for office um oh man it was an eye opener it, it's like um you know when you see on tv and you see politics you think see things happen it's like you don't think that it's real but it really is real so i'm gonna tell you um uh, my birthday's in september uh, the primary in, in our state, uh, in our city, is really important. If you make the primary nine times out of ten, because we're a Democratic city, state, and town, you will then make the general election in November. So, ran for office. Um, I'm 24. So, I was successful in the primary, first time running, right? So, then the swearing-in ceremony was in January. So, at that time, from September to January, I've now turned 25, from the primary election when I was, you know, elected. So coming into city government, it was just adapting to being, I'm the novice, you know, uh, I'm just a kid, you know, all those terms, uh, you know, there were people who said you need to wait your turn. Um, you know, I heard that conversation then and even now where people say, nah, you need to wait your turn. Uh, you know, you need to, but yet people always talk about reaching back and pulling somebody along. And I'm yep. like, well, you're talking out both sides of your mouth. So ageism from the standpoint of even now where people are saying, oh, no, you know, I don't think you have uh, the experience. I don't know that you have the knowledge. But the truth be told, I'm the only candidate in the race that has legislative experience uh, from a council standpoint. None of these other individuals that are in the race have it. And our city has proven that individuals that have been on both sides of the aisle, being on council and on the executive branch, have a better footing and know how on how to operate our city. So to say that, you know, the age is a factor uh, and I, I'm a novice because I'm younger and things of that nature, uh, man, I get it. I mean, let's well, right. I, more time. I mean, I. Yeah, people will say you have, people will say you have plenty of time. Why don't you take a seat for right now? Man, you know, look, <laughs> man, just being upfront and honest. There are people that are right now who are having conversations and who have been saying, hey, man, why don't you call Justin and tell him, you know, let, let's sit back, let's wait, and, uh, you know, he can he can, he can can run later on in life and, you know, things of that nature. And so all those calls I've gotten, all those messages I've received, and yet you have the same breath, you have other people say, oh, no, we need new leadership, we need new leadership. Well, this is an opportunity to have a new generation of leadership and not the same baby boomers on up, no offense to them, uh, to you know, lead our city with a fresh perspective and a different ideology uh, than what's there and what's been there, the bureaucracies that we experience. All right. So part of this show is we, we, we try to make sure that if we assume people don't know all the things that we're talking about. So I love the fact that, you you know, I want to keep continue to drop a few gems, uh, you know, albeit primaries, I believe, what, September 15th? Yes, sir. Tuesday. Yes, sir. Um, you know, general election, November first week, you know, like all of those things. But I also, I want to, let's take a step back. Who are you running against? Are you running against multiple people, one person? Assume we don't know. 
Okay, so uh, how's this work? Who's in the Who's in the race? So, so there. So I put it like this: There are two other people that are in the race. There's an incumbent, and then there's another individual that's running for office. So in total, there's three candidates. Uh, that's in the Democratic primary. There is no Republican or other party opponent. Mm-hmm. So on September 15th, by 9 30, 10 o'clock at night, that person will be the incoming mayor. Okay, so let's mayor. let's let's do some simple math here. We have three candidates, uh, two of two for whom are people of color, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And and one's not who is is the sitting um person. So that per the person that you're running against, have you heard any rumblings of the two of you possibly splitting votes. And how oh, do you feel about that? I want to talk yes, about sir. that just because there, you know, some may argue that, you know, in situations like this, you could absolutely put your heads together and you could have possibly run for that person's seat and that person could have run for this seat and everybody would be happy. Talk talk to us about it. <laughs> You know what? We should have. Well, I feel like I want to be on here every week. Okay. Hey, we can do that. <laughs> so look. So listen. The fundamental truth is this: the other candidate of color was filed for re-election within the office that they hold, right? Yeah. So Tuesday was the filing deadline. I filed a run for mayor. So now the incumbent and I, as of Tuesday, are the only two in the race. As of Wednesday, we're the only two in the race. As of Thursday, we're the only two in the race. Now, the state uh, guidelines say the filing deadline is Tuesday. However, you can shift an office by Friday if you have already filed by Tuesday. So, hypothetically, I filed a run for mayor Tuesday. Mm-hmm. At Friday, I could have said I want to run for governor. And, w- and could have switched and just paid the filing fee difference. Okay, yep. um, so that's what the other person did. So I'm already in the race. I already knew what I wanted. I knew where I was going. I never wavered in my position. So, excuse me. When, when the conversations came about, I said I think it's disrespectful to kind of ask me to step out of the race when I filed initially first, and I knew what I was going for. I'm not wavering, as we know. I, I hate to do this, but you know the Bible says double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. ways yeah. You know, so I already knew there was no because again, being on a council side, you need six other people, you need eight other people to to get things approved and to make things happen. Whereas you can't affect change to the level that you think you can. You know, and and, and you're a legislative branch of government, whereas on the executive side. You basically set the agenda for the city. So again, having been on council, knowing the differences, that's kind of where I I am in, as far as history. But again, I so I'm in file and uh, I'm in it. I hear you. So, so, but stay there for a minute because, again, let's assume people don't know anything about any of this, right? Um, the whole notion that you can file and then changed by the following Friday, is that new or is that something that has always been in place? To my understanding, I, look, I've never done it. So I, I, every time I fought, I ran for office, but I understand it's something that has been in, on the books. Okay. To my understanding, I, 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 I'm being told. So in, the books. in other words, in about. other words, you can, you could possibly say, okay, this is a safe lane for me. So this is the direction I'm going to go in. I'll sit back and see who's going to run and then contingent upon who's going to run, I could switch up. Essentially, that's what could happen. Uh, essentially, that's what happens. <laughs> okay. So look, I don't want to, I don't think we should put a, a lot of energy behind that. I think I want to talk to you more about your platform and talk to us about what you're running on. Uh, you've made a number of statements and I, I want to uh, unpack some of those things, but I want to know from your mouth, What's your platform? Okay, so um, I, I kind of talked about my history and how, how I brought up the values that I had instilled in me by my parents and things of that nature. Also, being in the city, uh, being from the city and understanding the dynamics of the city right now and just seeing overall what I believe the city needs. Um, so uh, a couple of things that we want to do in, in this society that we're in, uh, we want to ensure that we can bring body cameras 
back. We want to also create a neighborhood coordinated program with policing where individuals so right now you can go on the corner and you can see a, a, a group of police officers on the corner, but they're talking amongst each other. They're congregating. They're not engaging the community knowing, oh, this is Miss Brown on the, on the corner of 29th and Tacno, or, you know, this is Miss So-and-so or Mr. Uh, on the corner of Fourth and Jackson, that they're not really so much doing that. Not saying all officers, but the overwhelming majority. So we have to build and strengthen relationships. Also, let me say this: while I was on council, uh, the initiatives that I took on, uh, restoring voter rights for ex felons, banning the box, making sure that that question about do you have a felony that that's taken off the application. So we again, I've always been at the forefront of trying to uh, advocate for Wilmingtonians and for those who. Uh, felt like, uh, you know, government is not there for them, okay? Uh, so, um, gave you some points from a public safety uh, standpoint, if you will. Uh, the other point is, I, I, I know that being in government, uh, I, I'm going to tell a short, quick story if I can. There was a father. He was driving. Uh, always, he's a busy guy, never really had time to, you know, spend because he was traveling, he was working with his family, doing a lot of things. So, this Unforeseen Saturday, had his Saturday off. Come on, we're going to take a road trip. Takes his wife, his two sons, and they're driving. So he tells his children, we're going to the amusement park, right? So they're driving to the amusement park, and the car is just like hushed tones. Nobody's really excited. So get to the amusement park, pay all the money for the passes, spend basically the whole day there. And on the ride home, dad's like, um, you know, what, like, what's wrong? And, you know, we, we, we spent the whole day at the amusement park, and spent X number of dollars. Like, why aren't you happy? And you know what the children said? Dad, you never asked us what we wanted. We just wanted to go get some video games and spend time at home. So I said that to say, in government, we always push our agenda and say, this is what we want. We never really listen and hear from the people. And that's one of the problems that we have in government. As you see, or you would know, when city council meetings and things happen, the only people that are really there are the department heads or the truly, truly engaged individuals in our community. So we need to come out from those four walls. We need to have town halls. We want to create, we also want to create district action plans so that for all eight districts within the city, we have a plan for each district that's being cultivated by the residents of the district and not so much me saying, oh, well, you know what? We need to spruce up this park. Okay, we'll put some money in the budget. We'll spruce that park up. Oh, okay, you know, we need to make sure uh, we, we make sure that we uh, pick up the trash on this block a little earlier than normal and not wait until the middle of the day. You know, so we want to hear from the exact residents and this is going to be uh, a campaign of the neighborhood mayor because I want to restore neighbor back in neighborhood. We want to restore the public trust. Uh, a lot of uh, the other two candidates have been in litigation back and forth. Our tax dollars being spent upon their petty squabbles across the aisles within their own building. Also, you know, this administration is in a lawsuit against the fire department. It's in the newspaper. It's public. You can read it. So at a time when it's COVID, when revenues are, 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 are vulnerable, we're, we're having lawsuits going on at our tax uh, dollars are paying for. And it's to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. All right, now, Justin. So I want, I want to stop you there because you've mentioned COVID twice, right? So in right. light of COVID-19, the next mayor will have to confront what this pandemic has essentially done to the city, right? Yes, so how do you plan to address the impacts of COVID-19 and move the city forward as it looks to rebuild? What specifically? Okay, okay, so um, what we wanna do is, as mayor, we will create the Office of the Public Health Commissioner. This administration has been less than visible and ahead of the curve on the issues of informing residents on having a recovery plan to ensure that we are uh, pushing safety. Uh, I had a gentleman stop me at the cleaners just a week ago saying, hey, he works for the Public Works Department. Somebody was infected. It was a lot of hushed tones, nobody really knowing. So he went to his own doctor to get tested mm -hmm. because they were hushed trying to keep everything hush hush instead of like nah being out ahead of it being in front of it and informing your citizenry Transparency. Uh, the city council building you know so we want to create the office of the public health commissioner right also we want to create uh the office of workforce development within that office we're going to create an initiative where we will prepare individuals for job readiness we ensure that they have the skills that they need so that they can get to employment, that they can have the proper application and things of that nature. So we want to make sure that we're creating opportunities. The other thing that I did while I was on council, I created the diversity plan. This diversity plan meant that every contract that the city had from a construction or a certain dollar amount, um, that these 
big industries or these companies that come here, whereas this man has put property over people, but these, these, these industries will have to create a diversity plan saying we're going to engage residents in the city of Wilmington and give them employable opportunities by doing X, Y, Z, putting it out black and white. You know, so we want to make sure that we are putting benchmarks, we are putting systems in place that ensure that our citizenry is able to have an opportunity and a fair chance at employment, a fair chance at the job rating skills, and just a fair chance all around with safety and ensuring that they know what to do, when to do, and how to do. I like it. I like it. I specifically, uh, some buzzwords for me, uh, well, specific ones are workforce development. I know there's a lot of funding out there. Uh, I'm in the grant world, so workforce development is a thing. So I think you will do well with that. Um, people don't tend to care how much you know until they know how much you care. How much have you shown Wilmington uh, how much you care? Man, uh, I, I, don't, I honestly uh, don't think that uh, Wilmington uh, can say that I don't care. And, you know, I, I'm more of a person, I'm not so much on words, I'm more on actions. Uh, and so, I oftentimes, if you if you know me, you're, you're, you're close to me, uh, you, you're around me all the time, I say, look, I, I love to hear, you know, I love you, I appreciate you, but what are you showing? What are your actions doing? So, I have been in the community, around the community, on a number of different issues. I mean, over the years, we've we've uh, had scholarships, uh, we, we've had community days. I've been out in the muck and mire with the people in the streets for cleanups. Uh, just a number of different things that have taken place in showing initiative. Also, there are individuals that call and just need direction. And I've been a person that's been visible, following up, and things of that nature. So um, then another thing is, is that I'm, I'm common because the, 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 the impacts that every woman Tony has faced, which we know is the negative impacts of gun violence, I've, I've experienced, you know, firsthand as far as family and things of that nature. So, so Wilmington knows, and because of the reputation that my family has had and has built over the years, being here with the established business for over 30 years, the trust is there because they know the heart based upon the actions and what we've done over the years. You know, it's funny. You 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 mentioned your family a few times, and and I and I love the the you tweeted something one time, and it said, "I am just like you, and together we are Wilmington." Now is the time for one of us to represent all of us. I want yes, us to dig a little deeper in that. You know, one could argue as an outsider looking in that you, you know, yeah, you might can relate to the streets, but you come from a pretty prominent family, right? So you have some sense of we'll call it black privilege. Do you, do you think that there are some folks out there that don't necessarily see themselves in you? And how do you, how do you combat that? I combat that this way. So uh, my family, I was born in 83, right? Mm -hmm. My family business started in 87, okay? So the struggles of a business, you know, it takes possibly seven years for a business to really get up off the ground. So I, I, I wasn't I, I wasn't born in household right was here, our business was here, and we were flourishing, we were, you know, thriving. So just like any other child, Jackson Street Boys Club, which is now torn down, I went there. I played there. People know me. Going around the corner of the roses to getting something to eat. The Clifford uh, to um, Browns Boys and Girls Club. You know, I'm tangible. I'm here. I'm local. Uh, so I've had experiences there. Going to Bancroft Youth Enrichment Camp during the summer. Uh, Saturday Academy at Howard High School. Going to FAME, Form to Advance, Minorities in Engineering. You know, all those programs, all those things. I, I, that, that's what a lot of the, the everyday citizens and Wilmingtonians were a part of and did. And even down to Boys and Girl Scouts. I went to South Bridge and Mr. Larry Carter um, used to be in Mount Sinai uh, Baptist Church basement in South Bridge. So all the normal things we, we, we did and we were, we were never above. We were never above. And then uh, even being a part of the community from the standpoint of the West Side. Like when, when I was born, we were living on Lancaster Avenue in Silver Spring Apartments, right? From there, we lived with my grandmother on West Side on Fifth and Franklin. From there, then we came over to the North Side. So it's never been a silver spoon. You know, people just, they see where you are now and they don't know the story. And that's the, that's the problem in a lot of, a lot of things and a lot of 
uh, uh, of issues. But I'll tell you this. There's a young gentleman by the name of Carter. I'm not going to get his full name. He's 15 years old. Mm -hmm. he his mom said, look, I want you to study the, the three mayoral candidates and figure out which one you think you best align with or which one you agree with their values. Well, I'm here to tell you that on yesterday, Carter was out with us in the community. And he said that he saw himself in me at 15. Okay. When I was on council, I attended PS DuPont Elementary School in the sixth grade, right? As a youngster. I was on council. A young gentleman requested I come to his class, right? Come to his class, and I spoke to the class. And what did he say? He wanted to be like me. So I'm not too high. And I'm not too low. You know, I, I, I've been able to have the common touch. I've been able to sit with those who would you consider more established as well. So I'm well-rounded in that. And so I think that's a plus two. And a lot of residents see, and you can, you can tell, like you said, being a shit, you can tell somebody is taking for me. You can tell somebody is real. You know, and, and, and so I think with that, people know and understand the genuine person that I am. And, 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 and so, so if we want to be philosophical, my middle name is Alexander. It means the helper of mankind. <laughs> that's interesting. My uh, I got That's one of our family names. So my <laughs> daughter, her middle name. Um, well, that doesn't matter. Uh, that, that's irrelevant. But my, my son's middle name is Alexander. My father's. No, my uncle's middle name is uh, no, his name is Alexander, and my uh, grandfather's name is Alexander. So it just keeps going on and on and on and on. So we keep that going. But I feel you. Um, we're half an hour in. What's your timing looking like? Um, what do you, what do you need it to look like? I need at least another half an hour. At least another half an hour. Okay. All right. Now, I, I'll commit that. My team is uh. So again, let me express my attire. So okay. You on the streets? We, we, we know, huh? You on the streets, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so uh, the team is out, and it's cool. One thing I do, uh, also being tangible, and it's, and it's a lot of people appreciate that too. Man, I'm not just sending people out on the streets. I'm out with them. I'm out. Like last night, we were on uh, on, on Brown Town, and we were, you know, knocking doors and things like that. And one of the ladies said, "Uh, uh, I'm not voting for somebody I don't see. I'm not voting for somebody I don't know." And so when my teammates said, well, he's around the corner, just so happened I turned the corner. It's like, oh, well, he's right there. Went right down the street and talked to him. Like, I'm, I, I, I mean, this is serious to me, and I'm putting in the blood, sweat, and tears to show it. So, the, again, hence, this is my attire because as soon as we get off this call, I'm going, I'm going over wherever they are. And I think we're doing West Side today. So that's where I'll be back. All right. So Mom Duke said drop her off a shirt. Uh, yeah, just don't pair no mind. Okay. <laughs> so we talked about the streets, man. Um, I want to dig a little into uh, violence because why well, be on this platform if we don't, uh, you know, address certain things? And, you know, a wise man once said, you can't fix what you're not willing to face. Right. Oh, um, so as our city experiences an influx of violent crimes, particularly from our juvenile population, Justin, like what are your initiatives and or strategies, um, like what strategies would you consider um, in redirecting the energy of our youth from such a negative space? Um, so uh, a couple of things. Um, there is or there was a program uh, it's called like Lights On After School. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our faith-based faith -based communities or churches are in high poverty, high crime areas. So government cannot fund this by themselves they cannot do everything by themselves so it's going to have to be partnerships so we're going to have to cultivate relationships with our faith-based communities and like when i when i was uh, growing up at bethlehem we had thursday academy through the sons of allen and so that was time where the men would come uh, there was the bethany church over north side used to have homework in the sandwich and i would go there and volunteer from time to time help children with their you know their homework and then also be there because let's be honest before COVID, even now there are some people that are working either night jobs or two and three jobs okay and so in, in, in doing that they don't get an opportunity to possibly eat or have supervision so we want to create opportunities and avenues for them to to, to be to have um, you know, positive outlets in a sense, in enrichment. But we also need to strengthen the community centers, as I alluded to earlier, Jackson Street is closed, 
you know, there has been some investments in West Center City, uh, which when I was on council, the uh, we had $985,000 that we had set aside, um, just under a million that was set aside there for those purposes. Um, so now it was carried out. Um, so that, that's a great thing. You had the PAL on the, on the north side. So we're going to have to engage our youth. And also we're going to have to have a concerted effort and a true effort from parents. I mean, okay. we're going to have to uh, create programs that we can kind of, I don't want to say teach our parents, but help strengthen our parents, if you will, because it's going to be twofold. We can't just cater to one side and then there's no reinforcement. So there are going to be a number of programs that we have, and I, and I don't want to delve, delve too, too deep into the, to the weeds, if you will, um, but there are a number of things that we have uh, in place that we're going to, you know, help cultivate and make happen and come to fruition. Uh the other comment that came up was my mom. She said that she didn't think that you knew that she was my mom, but you know who my mom is. Without question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What exactly does support look like for you when it comes to those within your community? So if you could get, uh, essentially, if you can get all the support that you need right now for this race to bring you home, what does that look like? What do you need from the community? Um, well, I guess support is support. So when I say support, I mean, Foremost, we need your, 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 your there, there are three things that you always need uh, when you're running, running a campaign. So you need to sweat equity. So you need some people that's going to roll up the sleeves, that's going to work with you. Like I have some teams, some volunteers that are out with us in the street. So you need that. You also need individuals that are going to, you know, champion the cause and help shed and spread your message. So messaging is needed. So you need that. And then, you know, the other thing that, that sometimes helps is uh, for those that, that don't or, or need it is money. You know, that helps support the campaign. You know, in, 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 in certain communities, they say, you know, show me your checkbook and I'll show you your priorities. You know, so those, those are three ways, uh, short tail signs of support uh, for people because at the end of the day, one of the things we know is that signs don't vote, but they do show support within a certain degree. Um, so we want to uh, make sure that we have the support of individuals who are, and also your prayers. I mean, you know, that. that they, they can reach places that you know other things cannot. So um, all, all is all in all, uh, support is support from whatever you feel that you can do positively to support the campaign or to support the vision. Again, if it's just hosting a, a meet and greet or, or some type of Zoom meeting and say, hey, let's get this platform out there, let's share this information. You know, all those are things that can be done to show support. Awesome. So a pair of lips will say anything. Um, I'll say it again. A pair of lips will say anything. You're going to have people that are going to turn to you, uh, quote unquote, uh, will pass you and say certain things, uh, give you words of encouragement and all the while say things that are unbecoming, you know, uh, about you behind your back. You know, at the end of the day, you know, what do you regardless of what people do publicly and or privately? What would you tell them uh, about your commitment to Wilmington? It, it, it's just on a very practical level. If they just weren't believers, and because most people who don't believe will never tell you to your face that they don't believe, what's the one thing if they don't hear anything else that comes out your mouth that you want them to leave with today? The one thing I want them to leave with is uh, simply at the end of the day, if you don't know a person, you got to get to know them. Because what happens is, let's say you and I are on the outs, right? We're, we're friends, but we're having an issue right now. So we might not be in a good space. Let's say your wife or my wife knows that we're not in a good space. And then your wife is now going to not like me. My wife, vice versa, will not like you. But yet, you and I... You know, you know my wife well. Yeah. <laughs> well, well. <laughs> in a matter of, of days, right? Yeah. And then they're still mad. But yep. they're going off of hearsay. And all too often, I had a number of conversations here recently where individuals have, oh, well, I didn't know this happened like that. Or I didn't know this fact. And so I want you to research. I want people to research and find out for themselves. Have the conversations directly yourself and know me for me, not for what you heard somebody said, not for what you uh, heard somebody experienced, but for me. Because unfortunately, 
in these tumultuous times that we're in, you know, people, it's the social media climate. So I'm, I'm sure you'll go on social media and see some things that people said about me probably they don't like some some things that people have liked. And, and all in all, some of it, you know, um, is is not, uh, it's more of a, it's, it's opinion, it's not fact. And well, I would say most of it, but, um, you know, just trying to be a little kind on it. But uh, again, so again, I want people to actually say that they have had a conversation with me or they come in contact with me flat footed up front and say who they experienced me to be and not who they heard I was. So we have a question from uh, one of our viewers and he says, how can we divert the youth's attention from the entitlement phase and have them focus more on the importance of uh, education at a young age? The harsh reality is, is that charity begins at home and we have to, as I said, create opportunities where we encourage, uh, we, you know, we have an instant gratification uh, society. For now, sure. when, I grew up, when I grew up, my dad didn't buy sneakers or jeans. We had to work. If we had sneakers or jeans, we paid for them because we worked, mm -hmm. not because my parents purchased them. But in this society, my, my, not, my three year old, his sneakers are seventy five, one hundred dollars. And he's three, you know, and so what we do is we unfortunately feed the bad habit because we just give them whatever we feel as though they want. It's the latest sneaker. It's the latest this. It's the latest that. And so we provide. So we we actually create the culture and the mindset for our young people. We put where the values are. Now, uh, I'll show you a, a quick a quick difference. Right now, you, you know, we're out of school. We know we had COVID, so children were learning um, through through social uh, through Zoom and other avenues. Well, what did I have to do? Well, with my wife's help, we got my son a tutor mm. because the importance is you're not going to sit home, be on your, your phone every day, playing with your Legos or PlayStation, whatever it is, all day, and do just your thirty minutes on the computer and be done. So we have to have positive reinforcement at home. Now, some people say, well, you know, there are no positive reinforcements at home or anything of that nature. But again, that's when it comes into, uh, as I spoke about, the faith-based partnerships, the district action plans, and other uh, avenues that are out here that we can create uh, programming to support. Now, when uh, Cory Booker was the mayor of uh, Newark, New Jersey, he had a, a fellowship program that he had created, which helped to uh, create the relationship where the fathers and sons will come together, you know, and it's kind of what I alluded to that Bethel had was called like the Thursday program uh, through the Sons of Allen. And they would come in, they would kind of take the, the fathers off and, okay, what, what areas do you think you feel as though you're struggling or we can strengthen you in as a parent? And then at, on the other side, they'll have the children and just give them like somewhat of a social outlet, if you will. So these types of things are what's going to have to happen and take place. Again, Everybody looks to government for all the answers. Government does not have all the answers, but as the mayor of the city of Wilmington, we have to advocate for every resident, every citizen, every guest that walks and comes through our city we're responsible for, and we will continue to advocate. We will continue to look for partnerships. We will continue to research grants to ensure that we are creating all avenues that are possible to improve and augment the lives of Wilmingtonians. Good. Um... Justin, there's a, there's a human side to leadership. And I can honestly say that you are a man that has done great things uh, for the city of Wilmington. Um, but uh, unfortunately, there are some folks that, you know, you're a figure, you're a public figure that people look at. And some may not even feel like they can really approach and or touch you. And so, Typically, how we feel about ourselves is not always the, the reality of how other people may feel about us. I want to kind of dig deeper in terms of the human side of leadership, because I'm I'm typically on the other side of the table where I'm able to kind of, you know, lift the veil a little bit and 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 have a, a deep conversation with my pastor. Right. Or have a um, dinner with, you know, someone that's a public figure and you start to see people for who they really are but that heart and that grit is not always um overtly seen so a few questions how important is family your wife your kids in this process uh you this is just second go round uh you're in politics at this point and i'm sure this is not the ending of of your stint Talk to us about how important family is uh, at this very moment. 
<laughs> I could not be who I am. I could not be where I am without my family. Um, you know, so uh, in our family business, uh, I had my aunt, I had my mom uh, who was here. They show support there. Right now, there's a, a, a community movie night. My wife and my sons are there. My grandmother is there. So the support of family has always been prevalent in my life. Um, it, we, we've always been a strong family, um, and that's from my uh, my mother, her upbringing, and my, my father as well. Um, we've always been a supportive family, and without family, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't be who I am because family, uh, they share you. Uh, they, they, they bear the brunt when it's like, hey, man, uh, I might not make it tonight or, you know, uh, We'll have to do dinner another time or you have to go without me, you know, those types of things. So family uh, and, and you'll see uh, in my literature that we're a supportive family. And my family is there as well. So they're a part of the process. Um, they're a part of um, helping out. And uh, again, building a family business. I was three when my, my parents started our business. And my first job was handing out mints. So, you know, uh, again, family is, is an integral part of, of what we do and who we are. Let's talk quickly about motivation. Uh, when all hell breaks loose, or I mean, let's let's let's, let's face it. Sometimes you do feel like giving up. Um, all of us, you know, that's the human side of leadership. When you just lack the fervor that you need to continue to do the work that you do, where do you get your motivation? And and again, you know, one can argue it's it's your faith, um, so on and so forth. But outside of that, where do you find the strength? Like, who is strong for the strong? when you had those moments where you're like, you're just tired of the ish. Well, I, I, I go back to what we just said. You know, there's a there's a three-year-old uh, by the name of Alex Reginald Wright. Okay. <laughs> and that guy will make me feel like I'm the president of the, U the United States of America when I walk in that door. When I, when I call either his brother or his mom's phone, what's up, dad? Hey, Dad. You know, it's, it's you know, I, 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 just 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 the smile on his face. His brother, his brother now, you know, he's nine grade B ten, so he's a you know he's a what's up, Dad, but he's not as enthusiastic, you know. But um, just just taking him to the barber shop, you know, as fathers do with their sons, uh, having those opportunities, you know, taking him to the mall to get a pair of sneakers, uh, you know, those things right there. Um, they are the reason why. I am, you know, my father, you know, the Bible talks about taking care of generations mm -hmm. and he was able to do that. And, and it's just my job to do the same. And uh, they are right now what strengthens me. My family is what strengthens me and keeps me. Um, by all means, we all means we all have low moments. We have low days, but there, there's a whole, uh, 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 one of my mentors, I'll say, and uh, one day I talked to him, he's like, man, you sound real low. And uh, he was like, what's wrong? And, you know, so he's like, I ain't saying nothing's wrong. He said, well, you just got to make it to tomorrow. He said, if you make it to tomorrow, hmm. every, everything will be all right. Everything that happened in yesterday, it, it will be gone. Like, if you just make it to tomorrow. And so, you know, I've been blessed. Um, neither one of my parents drink or smoke. I don't either. So those devices I don't have or don't need. So I don't have to, you know, that dependency there. So I'm fortunate in that regard. And it's just, again, having that family, the, the fortifying, strengthening, uh, when you have those low moments, man. And, uh, Sometimes it's just being quiet, you know, going, go taking a nap. Like, uh, let, me, let me let me sleep for about a good twenty minutes and get back up and go at it. And uh, you know, that's what happens. I like it. So we're at the home stretch. We got fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a part of the the segment where I like to call it rapid fire, but they don't always end up as such, right? So I'm going to ask you a few questions, and some of them air on the side of the human side of leadership. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, these are questions that are just asking you about who you are, how you think, what's your mentality. And so answer them however you see fit. First question. Name one thing you can't live without. You can't say family. <laughs> you said I can't say what? You can't say family. One thing I can't live without. Uh, I think I, I can't live without my, uh, I, I don't know, can I say my sanity? Yeah, for sure. Peace is a good thing. I, I, a piece of, I, I mean, I can't live without a, a, a peace of mind or uh, uh, actually, you know, at the end of the day, I want people to say, you know, I might not like the guy. Uh, he might not be my cup of tea, but he was fair. He was just. 
and he fought for what he believed in, and he was not, uh, you know, bought or purchased. Hmm. We're going to leave that right there. Next question. Think of your worst heartbreak and tell us what lesson you learned. We don't need to know the heartbreak. Just want to know what lesson you learned. Um, I use a public, a public uh, a scenario. And one thing that I learned was you got to do your research. Um, I was faced with a, a vote early on when I first got elected to public office and people were calling me left and right trying to lobby me. And, uh, you know, I was like, oh, man, you know, I never experienced this before. And so when I made the vote, walked out into the council chambers, the hallway, and a uh, person said, well, can you tell me why you voted the way you did? And, and, and just gave me a couple of other questions. And I'm like, hey, I couldn't answer it. I was like, you found it. And at that very moment, I said, you know what? I got to, when, when I step out, if I say something, it's going to be factual. I will have researched it and I know it to be true. And you're going to stand on it. Good. Yeah. What do you want to retire doing? So this has everything to do with the end game. So this may or may not work out and we're going to claim that it does, right? Yes, what's, your, what's your end game? What do you want to retire doing? <laughs> I, I really don't know, man. I honestly, I, I mean, my, I've, I've had a life of service. So whatever it is, it's going to be me uh, being a part of the community some way, some way, shape or form, be it uh, in, in business, me serving the community uh, in that avenue, or me being in public service, serving the community that way. So it's going to be something with me involving supporting and serving people. What are you walking out of quarantine with that you didn't walk in having? Um, I'm walking out with a sense of, um, I guess, a, a better sense of the importance of taking time to value things that are important. Because when I walked into COVID-19, I was a person who's a workaholic, you know, uh, hey, think I'm just a workaholic. Like, you know, if, if I got a call at 10 o'clock at night and it involved, it involved work, I'm taking the call, uh, whatever it is, I'm just work, 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 work. to take time for yourself sometimes you have to take time for those that you love and appreciate because going into COVID I didn't have those same values and appreciation I just thought I gotta pay my dues now and whatever it takes I'm gonna pay my dues time I'll retire or you know take a step back happiness is a fleeting emotion as we know I mean it could storm outside tomorrow and or right now and all of a sudden we're not happy anymore but in this moment are you happy I am. Next question. Who's your favorite human on the planet? My favorite human? I'd say one person. One person. You're breaking up. I can't hear you. Still can't hear you, good brother. All right, there you go. Favorite human on the planet? Man, I, I gotta say one person. One person, good brother. It wasn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> so that all self be true. Learn to come. Me. All right, let's let's skip that one. You you still gotta live. Uh, what's the best advice anyone has ever given you to date? Mm. Wow, man, I, it's so many lessons uh, that I received. Um, unfortunately, this is going to sound real. Uh, it's going to sound like a colloquialism. It's going to sound like slang to some degree, but always check the checker. Always check the checker. Kind of like that. Always check the checker. My man said tough question. I don't think that was a tough question. That was pretty easy, right? 
I, I mean, you know, I, it, it, it's a bunch of things I can say, but yeah, I, I think um, always check the checker, and especially in, in, in politics, man. Jeez, you know, and and I always say, uh, you know, my belief is that I'm an elected leader. I'm not a politician. Um, I'm elected by the people to lead uh, because they see the value uh, in the leadership that I present. And thusly, that's who I am and, and why. OK, cool. So we're down to the home stretch. We got eight minutes. What questions do you have for me? OK, so my question is, uh, wh- wh- what made you uh, start this forum? Oh, man, this is um, so the Brothers Brunch, you may not know much about it, but we have three very important ingredients, cuisine, culture and connection. So um, with that, we are a organization that provides services and resources to men so that they can be better versions of themselves. So when you talk about workforce development, when you talk about recidivism, uh, when you talk mm-hmm. about uh, fatherhood initiatives, when you talk about you know being exposed to things that you wouldn't otherwise be exposed to, we're a platform to do that. So we're just trying to do meaningful work uh, so that we can show up as the best versions of ourselves. This is a platform where I can pretty much utilize the platform, however big or small it is, to bring dope individuals, uh, individual thinkers, uh, prospective thought leaders to the table. And it's a platform where I don't, there's no restrictions of who, what, where, why, and how I do business, <laughs> you know? Oh. So I, this is a platform where everybody has a voice and collectively we just, you know, try to bring some power to the table and expose people to things that they normally aren't exposed to. So good question. What else, what else you got? So what's your end game? Man, uh end game. There end game is I don't even it's so far away. I got so much that I want to do. I want a brick and mortar, you know, I want a space that is, you know, similar to the the gentleman's factory, you know, a, a safe and courageous brick and mortar, preferably with exposed brick. Um, but where brothers can come, you know, and and invent have resources, access to resources, play pool if they like. Um, so it can serve as a, um, an event space. We can uh, do do all the services. It could be a one stop shop where you know if brothers need you know resources, food, whatever the case may be. I love to be that space where brothers can actually um, just come together. Man, it just speaks volumes in terms of the brothers brunch and our three ingredients: cuisine, culture, and connection. So that ultimately would be a beautiful space where I also could grow our mentorship program which is so needed in our community there the end game is me working you know but not feeling like i'm working because i will be ultimately putting all of my efforts into the brothers brunch we're a nonprofit. uh the sky is the limit you know just but having access you know i, I noticed in delaware people are connected to all these these uh funding resources and i'm a baby in the game you know i'm from philly i'm coming in like wait I could do that. Like, hey, yo, I got a nonprofit. What's up? Like, you know, share the wealth. So really just putting the work in. um, I think the beauty in business is consistency. Some folks are out here. They may have the positions. They may have the titles. They may even have the resources and the money, but they're not consistent. They're not really they don't put I don't think a lot of people can outwork me. So I'm 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 grinding every day. Good question. Last question. Uh, Last question. Um, who's your favorite person? Wasn't expecting that. Um, <laughs> to be honest with you, I hope my, you're going to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely recorded. Uh, to be honest with you, I can say a lot of people, right? I'll just get that disclaimer. Oh, oh. <laughs> I can say a lot of people, but my favorite uh person on the planet is Isaiah Terman. You know, out. You know, it's funny. I always tell the kids like, "Yo, you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for my wife." Like, she come before you and all that. But like, in terms of just um, being able to look at a, a young man and completely see his soul when I see him, like I, I, I see how compassionate, how athletic, how um, dope he is as a as a young guy, and he's such an individual. And I think people spend uh, a lifetime trying to find themselves. You have to just met somebody that's like, yo, dude, you like, who are you anyway? Like, I I can't, I've known you for years and I still don't, I still can't tell who you are. And so to be 14 and to just have this unwavering um, 
ability to just, yo, he wants to be a skateboarder, he's going to go outside and skateboard. He wants to be a programmer, he's going to be at the computer and program. He wants to ball, he's going to ball. He wants to play football. He's on, he's plays the cross. Like he's in, he'll do one day. He was like, yo, I don't want to do sports. I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do the Lego league. Then went right back to football. Like he's, he's just trying to figure it out. And at 14, I wish I had the privilege and the freedom to just be him. You know, we, the conversations we have are so freaking um thoughtful. You know what I mean? Like this kid, he's the epitome of, you know, you know, the saying where they say kids don't do what you tell them. They, they do what they see. Like he's watching us, man, and he's not afraid to say, "Look, you know, well, this is what I notice, and this is how I feel." And I just feel like we're we're doing something right when it comes to this kid. My daughter's cool too. <laughs> man, I had another answer like that, and I, I I know some people might say, "Oh man, he, the answer he gave for that question was, was being a little uh, conceited," but no, I was being, <laughs> I was being safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro. I'm going to catch it. I'm going to catch it. Hey, listen, I appreciate you, man. Just just a quick recap, if I can, because I think I got two minutes. Um, you gave us four uh, really cool uh, tenants, if you will. You said sweat equity in terms of what you need from the community. Sweat equity, champions. You know, we know how important that is. You said money. Money's not bad. You also said prayers. I'm going to add a fifth component to that, and I'm going to say vote. There is an importance to vote. You're going to need some votes, uh, particularly in this in this climate, right? Talked about the Office of the Public Health Commissioner uh, pushing safety. That's a really important piece that I don't want us to miss. You also talked about Office of uh, Workforce Development. So we definitely want to hold you accountable for that. I love all that we're hearing with regards to the diversity plan, uh, fatherhood. You know, it seems like that's something that is that is important to you. So I love to be able to talk more when we talk again. Um, and I love just the things that you referenced in terms of, you know, things that you've seen back in the day, like lights on after school. You know, I think that those are the things that are going to be important when it comes to shaping uh, our neighborhoods, man. You know, like we we know about the neighborhood house and all of these, these resources, but they're not going to be any good to us if we don't obviously use them. So I love the fact of having district action, action plans, man. So I, I love everything that you're saying right now. And I'm just hoping that that folks really are tuned in. So if, if people want to read more about who you are and uh, what you have planned, where can they find you? Um, now, as you can see on the shirt, my name, there you go, justinwright.com. I appreciate I, that. I got you, good brother. <laughs> hey, listen, today we, <laughs> today we interviewed Justin Wright. Um, you know, he has a beautiful family. Um, you know, he comes from good stock. Any questions and or concerns, I'm sure he's uh, uh, the man for the people. So he, he's willing to lean in and answer those questions. You can find more information at www.justinwright.com. We really appreciate your time. If you don't have anything else to say, good brother, we're going to sign out. Well, I just want to say, uh, Brother Terman, thank you for this opportunity. To your viewers, uh, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions for me, please don't hesitate to ask. Hopefully, I, I've been able to uh, share just a, a glimpse of who I am and what I stand for uh, as we look to have your support on Tuesday, September 15th, as we become uh, the mayor of the city of Wilmington on a Democratic ticket. Thank you. That was Justin Wright signing off. Food for thought. Uh,